could you walk us through uh, one of the big um, things that you spend a lot of time on is this thing called the AI alignment problem. Uh, some people are convinced that or not. Some people are not convinced that when we create AI, that AI won't really just be fundamentally aligned with humans. I don't believe that you fall into that camp. I think you fall into the camp of when we do create this super intelligent generalized AI, we are going to have a hard time uh, aligning with it in terms of our morality and our ethics. Can you can you walk us through a little bit of that thought yeah, process? Yeah, I mean, the like, dumb why, way to why ask do you that, feel disaligned? The dumb way to ask that question too is like, uh, Eliezer, why do you think that the AI is automatically hates us? Like, why is it, it going to you? Why does it want to kill us all? The AI doesn't hate you, neither does it love you, and you're made of atoms that it can use for something else. It's, it's indifferent to you. <laughs> it's got something that it actually does care about, which makes no mention of you, and, and you are, are made of atoms that it can use for something else. That, that's all there is to it in the end. The reason, it, the reason you're not in its utility function is that the programmers did not know how to do that. The people who built the AI, or the people who built the AI that built the AI that built the AI, did not have the technical knowledge that nobody on earth has at the moment, as far as I know, whereby you can do that thing and you can control in detail what that thing ends up caring about. So <laughs> this feels like we're humanity is hurtling itself towards this, uh, what we're calling it, again, uh, an event horizon where there's like this AI escape velocity and there's nothing on the other side, as in we do not know what happens past that point as it relates to having some sort of super intelligent AI and how it might be able to manipulate the world. W would you agree with that? No. Um, again, the, the stockfish chess playing analogy, you cannot predict exactly what move it would make. Because in order to predict exactly what move that it would make, you would have to be at least that good at chess, and it's better than you. This is true even if it's just a little better than you. Sockfist is actually enormously better than you, to the point that when, once it tells you the move, you can't figure out a better move without consulting a different AI. Um, but even if it was just a bit better than you, even um, then you're in the same position. You know, this, this kind of disparity also exists between humans. You know, if you ask me, like, where will Gary Kasparov move on this chessboard? I'm like, I don't know, like, maybe here. And then if Gary Kasparov moves somewhere else, doesn't mean that he's wrong. It means that I'm wrong. I can't, pre if I could predict exactly where Gary Kasparov would move on a chessboard, I'd be Gary Kasparov. I'd be at least that good at chess. Possibly better. I could also be like able to predict him, but also like see an even better move than that. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the, that's an irreducible source of uncertainty with respect to super intelligence or anything that's smarter than you. Um, if you could predict exactly what it would do, it'd be that smart yourself. It doesn't mean you can predict no facts about it. So with Stockfish in particular, I can predict it's going to win the game. I know what it's optimizing for. I know where it's trying to steer the board. I can predict that I can't predict exactly what the board will end up looking like after Stockfish has finished winning its game against me. I can predict it will be in the class of states that are winning positions for black or white or whichever color Stockfish picked, because, you know, wins either way. And that's similarly where I'm getting the kind of prediction about everybody being dead. Because if everybody were alive, then there'd be some state that the superintelligence preferred to that state, which is all of the atoms making up these people and their farms are being used for something else that it values more. So if you postulate that everybody's still alive, I'm like, okay, well, like, why is it you're like postulating that Stockfish made a stupid chess move and ended up with a non-winning board position? That's where that prediction class of predictions come from. Can 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 you reinforce and reinforce this argument though a little bit? So like, why is it that an AI can't be nice, sort of like a a, a gentle parent to us, rather than sort of a murderer? looking to deconstruct our atoms and apply, you know, apply for you somewhere else. Like what, what are its goals and why can't they be aligned to at least some of our goals or maybe why can't it get into a status, which is, you know, somewhat like, like us and the ants, which is largely, we just ignore them unless they interfere in our business and come in our house and, you know, raid our cereal boxes. There's a bunch of different questions there. So first of all, the space of minds is very wide. All the humans are in, imagine like this giant sphere and all the humans are in this what, like one tiny corner of the sphere. And, you know, we're all like basically the same make and model of car, same running the same brand of engine. We're just all painted slightly different colors. 
somewhere in that mind space, there's things that are as nice as humans. There's things that are nicer than humans. There are things that are trustworthy and nice and kind in ways that no human can ever be. And there's even things that are so nice that they can understand the concept of leaving you alone and doing your own stuff sometimes instead of hanging around, trying to be like obsessively nice to you every minute and all the other famous disaster scenarios from ancient science fiction um, with folded hands by Jack Williamson is the one I'm quoting there. Um, we don't know how to reach into mind design space and pluck out an AI like that. It's not that they don't exist in principle. It's that we don't know how to do it. And I know like, Hand, hand back the conversational ball now and figure out it, like which, which which next question do you want to go down there? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, why? Like, why is it so difficult to sort of align an AI with even our basic um, notions of morality? I mean, I wouldn't say that it's difficult to align an AI with, a, with our basic notions of morality. I'd say that it's difficult to align an AI on a task like Build two identical strawberries, or, or no, let me, let, me, let me take this strawberry and make me another strawberry that's identical to this strawberry down to the cellular level, but not necessarily the atomic level. So it looks under the same under like a standard optical microscope, but maybe not a scanning electron microscope. You know, do that. Don't destroy the world as a side effect. Now, this does intrinsically take a powerful AI. There's no way you can make it easy to align by making it stupid. To build something that's cellular identical to a strawberry, uh, I mean, mostly I think the way that you do this is with like very primitive nanotechnology. We could also do it using very advanced biotechnology. And these these are not technologies that we already have, so it's got to be something smart enough to develop new technology. Never mind all the subtleties of morality. I think we don't have the technology to align an AI to the point where we can say. Build me a copy of the strawberry and don't destroy the world. Why do I think that? Well, case in point, look at natural selection building humans. Natural selection mutates the humans a bit, runs another generation, the fittest ones reproduce more, their genes become more prevalent to the next generation, Natural selection hasn't really had very much time to do this to modern humans at all, but, you know, the hominid line, the mammalian line, go back a few million generations. And this is an example of an optimization process building an intelligence. And natural selection asked us for only one thing. Make more copies of your DNA. Make your alleles more relatively prevalent in the gene pool. Maximize your inclusive reproductive fitness, not just like your own reproductive fitness, but your, you know, two brothers or eight cousins, as the joke goes. Because they've got, on average, one copy of your genes, two brothers, eight cousins. This is all we were optimized for, for millions of generations, creating humans from scratch, from the first accidentally self-replicating molecule. Internally, psychologically, inside our minds, we do not know what genes are. We do not know what DNA is. We do not know what alleles are. We have no concept of inclusive genetic fitness until it, you know, our, genet our scientists figure out what that even is. We don't know what we were being optimized for. For a long time, many memes thought they'd been created by God. And this is... When you, when you use the hill climbing paradigm and optimize for one single extremely pure thing, this is how much of it gets inside. In the ancestral environment, in the exact distribution that we were originally optimized for, humans did tend to end up using their intelligence to try to reproduce more. Put them into a different environment? And all the little bits and pieces and fragments of optimizing for fitness that were in us now do totally different stuff. We have sex, but we wear condoms. If natural selection had been a foresightful, intelligent kind of engineer that was able to engineer things successfully, it would have built us to be revolted by the thought of condoms. To 
men who would be lined up and fighting for the for the rights to donate to sperm banks. And in our it's in our natural environment, the little drives that got into us happened to lead to more reproduction, but distributional shift run the humans out of their out of their distribution and over which they were optimized. You get totally different results. And gradient descent set is would by default just like do not quite the same thing. It's going to do a weirder thing because natural selection has a much narrower information bottleneck. In one sense, you could say that natural selection was at an advantage because it finds simpler solutions. You could imagine some hopeful engineer who just built intelligences using gradient descent and found out that they end up wanting these like thousands and millions of little tiny things, none of which were exactly what, what the engineer wanted, and being like, well, let's try natural selection instead. It's got a much sharper information bottleneck. It'll find the simple specification of what I want. But we actually get there as humans. And then gradient descent probably may be even worse. But, but more importantly, I'm just pointing out that there is no physical law, computational law, mathematical logical law saying when you optimize using hill climbing on a very simple, very sharp criterion, you get a general intelligence that wants that thing. So just like natural mm. selection, our tools are too blunt in order to get to that level of granularity to like program in some sort of morality into these super intelligent systems or build me a copy of a strawberry without destroying the world mm. yeah the tools are too blunt so i just want to make sure i'm i'm following with with what you were saying uh i, I think the conclusion that that you left uh left me with is that my brain which i consider to be at least decently smart is actually a byproduct, an accidental by byproduct of this uh, desire to reproduce. And it's actually just like a tool that I have. Uh, and just like conscious thought is a tool, uh, which is uh, a useful tool in means of that end. And so if we're applying this to, to AI and AI's desire to achieve some certain goal, what's the, what's the parallel there? I mean... Every organ is your body is a reproductive organ. If it didn't mm -hmm. help you reproduce, you would not have an organ like that. Your brain is no exception. This is merely mm -hmm. conventional science and like merely the conventional understanding of the world. I am not saying anything here that ought to be at all controversial. You know, I'm sure it's controversial somewhere, but you know, <laughs> within within a pre-filtered audience, it should not be at all controversial. Um. And this is like the obvious thing to expect to happen with AI, because why wouldn't it? What new law of existence has been invoked, whereby this time we optimize for a thing and we get a thing that wants exactly what we optimized for on the outside? So what are the types of goals an AI might want to pursue? What types of utility functions is it going to want to pursue off the bat? Is it just those it's been programmed with, like make it an identical strawberry? Well, uh, the whole thing I'm saying is that we do not know how to get goals into a system. We can cause them to do a thing inside a distribution they were optimized over using gradient descent. But if you shift them outside of that distribution, I expect other weird things start happening. When they reflect on themselves, other weird things start happening. What kind of utility functions are in there? I mean... Darn if I know. I think you'd have a pretty hard time calling the shape of humans from advance by looking at natural selection, the thing that natural selection was optimizing for, if you'd never seen a human or anything like a human. If we optimize them from the outside to predict the next line of human text, like GPT-3, I don't actually think this line of technology leads to the end of the world, but if it, but maybe it does, and, you know, like GPT-7, you know... There's probably a bunch of stuff in there to that desires to accurately model things like humans under a wide range of circumstances, but it's not exactly humans. Because ice cream, ice cream didn't exist in the natural environment, the ancestral environment, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. There was nothing with that much sugar, salt, fat combined together as ice cream. 
there's we are not built to want ice cream. We were built to want strawberries, honey, um, a gazelle that you killed and cooked and had some fat in it and was therefore nourishing and gave you the all important calories you need to survive. Salt. So you didn't sweat too much and run out of salt. We evolved to want those things, but then ice cream comes along and it fits the those taste buds better than anything that existed in the environment that we were optimized over. So a very primitive, very basic, very unreliable wild guess, but, a, but at least an informed kind of wild guess. Maybe if you train a thing really hard to predict humans, then among the things that it likes are tiny little you, pseudo things that meet the definition of human but weren't in its training data and that are much easier to predict or where the problem of predicting them can be solved in a more satisfying way, where satisfying is not like human satisfaction, but some other criterion of thoughts like this are tasty because they help you predict the humans from the training data. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over 300,000 fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.